Hello, and welcome to our week two podcast on science and imperialism, the universal and its others. This podcast is designed to complement two handouts that are available to you on the course blackboard. One of the handouts contains some classical representations of science uh, from its foundation period, the foundation text of what would become the Enlightenment, uh, and some of the texts relate to eyewitness accounts of imperialism, of colonialism, uh, and contemporary reflections and reactions and increasingly critical reactions uh, to the colonial experience. I'll warn you in advance that some of the things discussed in this podcast and in the handouts are quite confronting. The images can be very confronting, are very visceral, um, and some of the language also is very charged and is language that we would find offensive today. I've left this in because I think that it's important to both preserve the integrity of the primary sources that we're looking at, um, but also to confront some of what's going on, some of what the stakes are when people are critical of or uncertain about the universal claims of science. The concern is that it emerges in a period where it is participating in and expressive of the imperial or colonial enterprise, and there is an implicatedness or a concern that there's an implicatedness in some of these forms of thought in colonial activities and in the forms of violence that are implicated in imperialism, in colonialism. So let's move forward. One of the ways to understand the emergence of classical science, uh, the concern that science has in particular with method and with the observation of nature is to see it as in part a response to a confrontation with difference. So these conceptions of science emerge in a period where there has been an intense confrontation, an intense and violent confrontation with cultural and religious difference in Western Europe. There is a long-term confrontation with Islam. There have been a series of religious wars within Europe associated with the Protestant Reformation. And then there's the process of global exploration and empire building, which has resulted in a confrontation with ways of life and forms of belief that are radically unknown in Western Europe before this period. And it creates a heightened awareness of the contingency of religious and cultural belief. It is quite confronting. People will ask themselves if they were born somewhere else, would they have believed something else? Their own beliefs are no longer, to use a technical word, doxic. They're no longer something that can simply be taken for granted. Uh, and you'll see people quite directly reflecting on what would have happened if I'd been born in some other country or if I'd been born in some other faith. I probably would have believed that too. I wouldn't have been the same me. And so there's a great searching for how it is that we can defend our convictions in inherited institutions in the confrontation with this experience of many, many, many different others. How can we achieve a common frame of reference when we can't rely on our traditions to provide this? And this is a major preoccupation of large numbers of thinkers. It is a flashpoint, and it is the thing with which the figures associated with the rise of classical science are associated. And the answer that they specifically provide is that while we may have different traditions, we may have different histories, we may have different customs, what we all have in common is access to a common natural world. And yet people do perceive that natural world differently, they interpret it differently. So how is it that we can use our common embeddedness in nature to achieve a commonness, a universality of reference? We do that, one of the solutions is proposed, we do that by coming up with a common method, a scientific method that we will apply to nature, and if we all look at the same object and apply the same method, we can reachieve, we can put back together our common frame of certainty, our common frame of reference. So the text that I've provided in the handout, I've included some passages from Bacon's New Organon, and this is a foundational text. You will see Bacon referred to over and over and over again in readings all through this term. He is a touch point for talking about the Enlightenment and what it means and science and what science means. And so Bacon is saying that we can arrive at a common frame of reference from applying a shared method to a universal object, which is nature. He says that we're the servants of nature. We can't know anything beyond nature. We're encompassed within it. It is what we know, and we know it by the means that it provides to us. 
and then he makes a very impactful comment. The knowledge of nature is what generates power. Human knowledge and human power meet in one. For where the cause is not known, the effect cannot be produced. Nature, to be commanded, must be obeyed. And this link between knowledge and power is something that a lot of people are going to look at critically in subsequent forms of theory. Uh, the suspicion of science is that it exists in the service of power, and in particular of state or imperial power. And the question of how we extract what we might find valuable from the scientific enterprise, given this complicated and dubious relationship with forms of oppression, with forms of despotism. Bacon talks about various idols that distort understanding. The language is interesting. He's using the language of sort of fake religious beliefs, various things that we have that distort our perception and thought. And all kinds of distortions are possible. We can have distortions that happen because we're humans and humans perceive things in a particular way. We can have distortions due to our sort of idiosyncratic cultures. We can have distortions due to what we're like individually. We can have distortions of our thought due to how we interact with and are persuaded by and swayed by other people. What do we do to deal with these distortions? Well, we engage in systematic, methodical experimentation. We engage in empirical research. He says the lack of systematic observation hinders progress of human knowledge. And he expresses a great deal of disdain for the fact that all sorts of inherited sources that have traditionally been looked at as authorities are people who, Bacon says, are basically doing nothing more than using gossip. They're using anecdote. They're using isolated one-off observations. And they're not making any systematic attempt to work out whether these observations are valid. So he says what we need to do instead is carry out experiments systematically and decide on a sound and regular method and that this is going to provide the basis for improving our knowledge. He says, for experience, when it wanders in its own track, so when we just do what we would do by default, what comes naturally to us, is mere groping in the dark. It confounds men rather than instructs them. But when it shall proceed in accordance with a fixed law, in regular order and without interruption, then may better things be hoped of knowledge. So Bacon has a vast, systematic, experimental, empirical research project that he wants to entertain, that has the job of putting together generalizable principles based on these systematic observations. And then we might have some security, some soundness to our knowledge, but it's got to be constructed at great effort. It can't just be received from traditional authorities passively. We've got to go out and create this new kind of knowledge. Another foundational figure that, again, you'll see referred to many times in the text to come this term is Descartes, René Descartes. Uh, he, among other things, writes a discourse on method, and it's got a similar set of concerns. He's confronting the problem of doubt and skepticism and how to find a firm foundation. And so how do we know in the face of doubt and skepticism, in the face of the awareness that we are often wrong, that we can't rely on our senses, that we can't rely on our reasoning, how do we come to certainty? And he starts off with uh, what's really a very nice joke uh, that is his first pass at suggesting that this is something we can do. He says, good sense is of all things among men the most equally distributed, for everyone thinks himself so abundantly provided with it that those even who are the most difficult to satisfy in everything else do not usually desire a larger measure of this quality than they already possess. This is a joke. Descartes is saying, if I go around and I ask you, are you deficient in sense? Is your reason deficient? You're going to say no. If I go around and ask you whether you have less reasoning capacity than someone else, you're going to say no. And Descartes saying, because everybody would say no to this, because people would be so insulted at the insinuation that they can reason less well than other people, we can assume that reason is equally distributed. Just a little opening joke. He goes on from that more seriously. He says, look, OK. We may agree that reason is equally distributed among people, that whole peoples are not more intelligent than other whole peoples, but the reality is people come to different conclusions. If we've all got an equivalent distribution of good sense and capacity to reason, why do we come to different conclusions? Why do we have different cultures? Why do people have different religious beliefs? Why does this happen if we are all reasonable people? And he says, it comes solely from this, 
The reason that it happens is that we conduct our thoughts along different ways and do not fix our attention on the same subjects. So again, much like Bacon, we need a method. We need to direct our thoughts along the same ways, not different ways. We need a regular method. And we need to direct them to the same objects. And once we do this, then we'll start generating common results. So we can use our common quality of reason, but we need a method and we need common objects in order to come up with universalizable results. And then Descartes quite famously runs through his course of sort of how you get out the other side of radical doubt. He talks about his uncertainty and doubt in existing knowledge and his decision to reject beliefs that are just derived from custom. He turns his analysis onto his self and seeks a new method for grounding knowledge. He wants what he calls a first principle for his philosophy, a kind of a bedrock from which he can then deduce everything else that he's going to conclude. And he says he's decided never to accept anything that is not clearly known to be true, break the problem that he's trying to resolve down into as many parts as small as they need to be in order to get it solved, move from the simplest to the more complex parts of the problem, and leave nothing out. Okay? He's claiming that he's going to be able to implement this method. And he says, my senses can be mistaken. My reasoning can come to wrong conclusions. My thoughts can be in error. I even have thoughts when I dream, he says. How do I know that I'm really awake? How do I know the difference between the dreaming and waking world? So he runs through all of these doubts. What is the solid foundation when you can doubt all of these things, when you can see other people making mistakes in all of these things? How can you be sure? And his answer is a subjective one. He says, but immediately upon this, I observe that whilst I this thus wish to think that all was false, it was absolutely necessary that I, who thus thought, should be somewhat. And as I observed that this truth, I think therefore I am, was so certain and of such evidence that no ground of doubt, however extravagant, could be alleged by skeptics capable of shaking it, I concluded that I might without scruple accept it as the first principle of the philosophy of which I was in search. I think therefore I am. You've probably heard this or run into it in other places, and other people will refer back to it. Uh, Descartes says that I can doubt that there is an I that is doing the doubting. I cannot experience myself doubting myself. I'm already there before the doubt happens. And he's going to take this as a first principle, and having that first principle, he's then going to try to deduce everything else from that. Other people will come up who are critical of this as an approach and will try to come up with other first principles. And then there will be philosophers from Hegel forward who say, you can't do this, you can't do the first principle step. You have to have something more relational to ground your philosophical system that goes outside the boundaries of the detail that we're going to go into here. But Bacon and Descartes represent the approaches associated with trying to get certainty out of this period of intense uncertainty and confrontation with otherness that is a period of formation of classical science. You can go the more empiricist uh, research route, trying to build things up through a vast methodical experimental apparatus, or you can try to bring things back to first principles and logically deduce a foundation uh, that usually implies some notion of people being common in some bedrock way that everyone will agree that they have in common. And then you have a growing set of texts as we move forward in time that express fears of science, fears of technology, uh, the vertigo of science, the feeling that it is ripping away old certainties and dragging us into an unknown for which we may not be prepared, which may have consequences that we didn't anticipate and are not able to control. And I've given you a passage from Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. I'm not going to quote much of it in this lecture, um, but you might want to take a look at it. It captures particularly well that sense of vertigo, the feeling that there is a power over life and death that historically has not been available to humans, that we now possess, that we don't fully understand and are possibly not prepared to wield. Okay, One of the little quotes I've put here from that chapter is the main character, to examine the causes of life, we must have recourse to death. How destructive is our science? 
and it's a fear that runs forward. There's a heady optimism about all of the things we can do, but running right alongside that optimism, really all the way through, uh, is a concern that we might not know what we're doing. And then a long passage, and again, I've quoted a lot of it in this lecture, but not all of it. You can take a look in the handout to see the rest. It's a passage from Nietzsche on the death of God, and this is quite a famous passage. And it starts out, and there's a madman running into the marketplace, and he's saying things, and he doesn't seem to be making any sense. And everyone in the market comes up and makes fun of him. He says, have you not heard of the madman who lit a lantern in the bright morning hours, ran to the marketplace, and cried incessantly, I seek God! I seek God! As many of those who did not believe in God were standing around just then, he provoked much laughter. Has he got lost? asked one. Did he lose his way like a child? asked another. Is he hiding? Is he afraid of us? Has he gone on a voyage, emigrated? They yelled and laughed. So they just think this guy's sort of a lunatic and are making fun of him. And then the stakes get higher. It turns a bit more serious. The madman jumped into their midst and pierced them with his eyes. Whither is God, he cried, I will tell you. We have killed him, you and I, all of us, his murderers. But how did we do this? How could we drink up the sea? Who gave us the sponge to wipe away the entire horizon? What were we doing when we unchained the earth from its sun? Whither is it moving now? Whither are we moving? Away from all suns? Are we not plunging continuously? Backward, sideward, forward, in all directions? Is there still any up or down? Are we not straying as through an infinite nothing? Do we not feel the breath of empty space? Has it not become colder? So this feeling of unmooring, this feeling that science and progress and the movement of technology breaking through old traditional structures of authority has left us unmoored. We don't know where we're going, the sense of vertigo, the sort of negative reaction to the movement of progress. And it continues, how shall we comfort ourselves, the murderers of all murderers? What was holiest and mightiest of all the world has yet owned, has bled to death under our knives? Who will wipe this blood off us? What water is there for us to clean ourselves? At last he threw his lantern on the ground, and it broke into pieces and went out. I've come too early, he said then. This deed is more distant from then than the most distant stars, and yet they have done it themselves. So this feeling again that we've unleashed a process unknowingly with unintended consequences that we're not in a position to understand and to control. This is a fear that accompanies progress, uh, a worry that often sparks criticisms of science, of the progress of technology, a fear that something has gotten out of our hands, we can't control the consequences, and that important things have been lost with this kind of progress. And then another strand running alongside and through the discussion of progress. This is an early source. I'm quoting a little bit of it here. More of it is contained in the handout. And again, it is quite confronting. Um, this is de Las Casas writing an account that is, in part at least, an eyewitness account of the destruction of the Indies, the behavior of a particular colonizing context. And He's expressing horror at the behavior of the colonizers. That's the point of the piece. The other thing the piece does, and if you take a look this week at the Stuart Hall reading, uh, Stuart Hall talks about this as a regular trope, it involves a heavy romanticization of the indigenous peoples who are being massacred. And these things are often twinned. Uh, so there can be a, a promotion of a particular vision of innocence or a projection of a particular kind of innocence or lack of sophistication onto indigenous populations, even by people who regard themselves as advocates for those populations. So de Las Casas says, now this infinite multitude of man are by the creation of God innocently simple, altogether void and averse to all manner of craft, subtlety, and malice and most obedient and loyal subjects to their native sovereigns, and behave themselves very patiently, submissively, and quietly toward the Spaniards, to whom they are subservient and subject." Okay, so it's an idealized vision of what the indigenous populations are like. It is a part of a critical discussion about Europe as being somewhat decrepit and artificial in its manners, and uh, a kind of overly innocent 
image of other cultures uh, is used as the mirror for a particular kind of critique of European customs. And then he moves into discussions of massacres. And there's an intense horror and I guess a shock uh, that in a period of progress in Europe, in a period of exploration and growing material wealth and rising power, you get this intense barbarism on the periphery. He says, the Spanish mounted on generous steeds, well weaponed with lances and swords, begin to exercise their bloody butcheries and stratagems, and overrunning their cities and towns spared no age or sex, nay not so much as woman with child, but ripping up their bellies tore them alive in pieces. They laid wagers among themselves, who should with a sword at one blow cut or divide a man in two. I once saw four or five of their most powerful lords laid on these gridirons and thereon roasted, and not far off two or three more overspread with the same commodity, man's flesh. So the Spaniards playing dice, entertaining themselves a helpless and innocent population, and massacres. What is the relationship of this to the claims to universality that emerge in European culture in the core at this time? And then we have Montaigne, who is a statesman. He's known as a tolerant figure in his own context. And he writes a piece called Of Cannibals. Uh, and again, cannibalism is one of these things that circulates around as a story about indigenous populations with some debate over when it might or might not be a true representation. But it is a common representation of what's going on in the colonized indigenous populations. And again, Montaigne turns an exoticizing gaze onto the colonies, even as this piece is trying to write a defense of them compared to the manners of the Europeans that are colonizing the area. He says, they are savages at the same rate that we say fruits are wild, which nature produces of herself and by her own ordinary progress. Whereas in truth, we ought rather to call those wild whose natures we have changed by our artifice and diverted from the common order. This distinction between artifice and nature, this distinction between societies in which deliberate decisions are made to alter things, and at least hypothetical or counterfactual societies where believe that things just arose organically. There's no disruption to what would happen naturally. So this gaze directed out at the colonies is assuming the indigenous populations don't have a created culture, don't have a anything artificial, haven't actively done anything to intervene in their histories. They're just natural, and it's Europe that is characterized by artifice, for better or for worse. And again, the Stuart Hall reading will uh, talk about this, as will a number of other texts that we'll read later in the term, most notably uh, Edward Said's Orientalism. Montaigne says, these nations then seem to me to be so far barbarous as having received but very little form and fashion from art and human invention and consequently to be not much remote from their original simplicity. Okay, so again, the idea that nothing's happened in these areas. They have no history. There's a book called Europe and the People Without History that talks about these kinds of conceptions of the colonial other. The laws of nature, however, govern them still, so they are more directly natural than the Europeans are perceived to be. Not yet as much vitiated with any mixture of ours, but tis in such purity that I am sometimes troubled that we were not sooner acquainted with these people, and that they were not discovered in better times, when there were men much more able to judge of them than we are. So it is a romantic notion that projects a European vision of simplicity and nature onto the colonial context, so that indigenous peoples are not allowed their own active role in their own active histories. And then he contrasts the practice of cannibalism with the tortures inflicted by the colonizers. Okay? And he doesn't have a problem with the idea that we would be critical of cannibalism, although he presents a fairly noble vision of how it works and what it's about in this same passage, and you can see that in the handout. But he says, I'm not sorry that we should here take notice of the barbarous horror of so cruel an action. So he doesn't mind if we're going to criticize what's going on in the indigenous custom. But what he is sorry about is that seeing so clearly into their faults, we should be so blind to our own. 
And so we focus on the atrocities committed by indigenous populations and pay no attention to our own atrocities. Okay, so this critical, this critical sensibility. The last thing in the handout is a series of poems, the first one of which is Kipling's The White Man's Burden, and the others are responses to it. They are parodic, critical, increasingly angry responses to it. They move forward in history. You can see the dates of them in the handout. And I've just put the first stanzas of them here, but reading the whole, these are not long pieces, and so I'd encourage you to read through all of them to get a feel for the anger that Kipling's sensibility provokes in his respondents. So Kipling says, take up the white man's burden, send forth the best ye breed, go bind your sons to exile to serve your captives need, to wait in heavy harness on fluttered folk and wild, your new-caught sullen peoples, half devil and half child. And it goes on, it's a sort of a discussion of the peculiar, what Kipling sees as a kind of a bravery and a duty involved in colonial service, even though you are resented uh, by the people that you're ruling and will be judged, possibly negatively, by history. Um, there's some debate over whether there's any parodic edge in the Kipling piece, um, but certainly the, the responses to it that you can find later in the handout are people who do take it at face value, and it is normally taken at face value. Uh, and push back and push back hard. So this is Henri Le Boucher, The Brown Man's Burden, uh, transgressive language, taboo language for us these days, already offensive language at the time this poem is written, and offensive language that is put into the mouths of the colonizers and of people like Kipling who are perceived to be apologizing for them. Pile on the brown man's burden to gratify your greed. Go, clear away the niggards whose progress, who progress would impede. Be very stern, for truly tis useless to be mild, with new-caught sullen peoples, half devil and half child. Dripping with sarcasm. Okay, what is in the background of the attempt to render noble colonial service here is nothing more than greed. There is an accusation that there is a rationalization that is used to justify the oppression of the colonial peoples. Uh, on the grounds that they would impede progress, but where progress involves the greed of the colonizers. Okay, so again, what does progress mean? Is there a meaningful way that we can think about progress given this history where progress is used to rationalize a worldwide process of domination? Johnson, Black Man's Burden. Pile on the black man's burden, tis nearest at your door. Why heed long bleeding Cuba or dark Hawaii's shore? Hail ye your fearless armies, which menace feeble folks who fight with clubs and arrows and brook your rifles smoke. So again, tearing down the attempt to render noble the colonial service, you're going against people whose defenses are essentially non-existent relative to the arms that the Europeans can bring to bear. And to render this noble is something that this poem suggests is absurd. Ernest Crosby, the real white man's burden. Okay, so this is going to pose what Kipling's description of colonial service in different terms. Take up the white man's burden, send forth your sturdy kin, and load them down with Bibles and cannonballs and gin. Throw in a few diseases to spread the tropic climes. For there, the healthy niggers are quite behind the times. So, you're bringing your Bibles, you're bringing your civilization, and behind them are cannonballs, the hard armed forces, and gin, and disease, things that are meant to undermine a healthy, functioning society that's there. And then Hubert Harrison, The Black Man's Burden. This is a particularly interesting one. It's written a bit later in time, and you can feel a greater mobilization of active sort of political and military opposition beginning to sort of shine through this poem. Take up the black man's burden, send forth the worst ye breed, and bind our sons in shackles to serve your selfish greed.
to wait in heavy harness, bedeviled and beguiled, until the fates remove you from a world you have defiled. I'd encourage you to read all of those in full. They're not difficult reading and they're not long, but it'll give you a feel for the historical movement of this kind of criticism, and it'll give us something that we'll follow through on. Uh, as we move into governmental systems and economic systems and look at the colonial relationship uh, further in the course. But so this combination of things is part of what our readings for this week are grappling with when they try to figure out how do we inherit the Enlightenment today? What bit of it are we inheriting? If there's something in a spirit of progress that we find meaningful and useful and emancipatory and valuable today, how do we separate it from the history of progress, which was used as a rationalization for various kinds of oppression? And how do we deal with the issue of unintended consequences or releasing problems upon the world through our science, our technology, our knowledge that we don't completely understand and don't completely control? Okay, so the readings for this week will pursue various responses to that problem.